All right, welcome back to All Cars You Haul. I am John, and I'm excited to be back. It is time for another reaction video to a Motor Week retro review. This week, I have chosen the 1994 Ford Thunderbird and Mercury Cougar XR7. Now, not the most exciting cars to be doing a reaction video on. However, they've got a place in my heart. If you've been a longtime viewer, you know that I have had a couple of Buick Regals. I don't know if I ever mentioned it, but both of those were two doors. So back when I was younger, I liked big American cars that rode great, and I liked the style of the two door. I felt like they kind of combined the best of both worlds. However, as I've gotten older, I think they're completely ridiculous and honestly the worst of every world. They're too big, too heavy to be truly sporty but you don't have the access of a four door and you know, it's hard to get out in parking spaces. These are ridiculous cars. I'm kind of glad that they've faded away. I'm not opposed to two doors, certainly in sports cars, it makes a lot of sense. But when you take something that's a mid-sized sedan and make it two door, it doesn't really work. But back in the day, I wanted a Thunderbird. I wanted something that was a little sportier, had a little more presence to it. I really dug these cars. I didn't, as I recall, I didn't dig the interiors. So as always, I have not watched this video in advance. I do not know what to expect, but I am super excited to see what they say because I really wanted one of these about this time. Let's take a look, guys. Motor Week is made possible by Lucas Oil. TireRight.com and RockAuto.com. When we first tested the current generation Ford Thunderbird and Mercury Cougar back in 1988, we said they were in a class by themselves. And it's true that even today there are few choices for lovers of big American rear wheel drive coupes. But while the T Bird and the Cougar have had their markets virtually cornered, that doesn't mean that their designers are content to let things slide. All right, so first up, let's talk about the styling. Let's focus on the T-Bird here for a minute. I dig this, I really do. And again, while I'm saying it's ridiculous, I like this car. I got to admit I do. Um, that long hood, I like the style at the front. I like the side of it. And look how big that backseat window is right there on the side uh, with these ridiculous little windows we've got now with huge blind spots that's kind of refreshing to see and uh, i'll talk more about the rear end when we get to it but i really like the profile of this car i still think it looks good the mercury behind it we're not seeing much of it maybe i'll talk more about it in a minute but i don't know like most mercuries you wonder why does it exist other than they could gussy it up a little bit and charge a higher price for it. The front end doesn't quite do it for me. That little grill, it's, is it sporty? Is it luxury? I guess it's like a sporty luxury coupe and I don't really know what it would be comparing with exactly. Let's see what they say. Our first encounter with the revised Ford Thunderbird and Mercury Cougar XR7 was a very soggy one. It seems that whatever summer rain didn't fall on the flooded Midwest found its way to Ford's Dearborn, Michigan test track. But it didn't dampen our enthusiasm for the major changes Ford has made to these six-year-old twins. And the rain stopped long enough for us to get plenty of track time with both a sleek Thunderbird Super Coupe and its more formal-looking Cougar XR7 sibling. Though still unmistakably a T-Bird, Ford did a nice job of freshening the front end. I'm sorry, that was a bad stop right there, but I'd like to say, I know that in person, they don't look quite like this, but looking at that profile, let me see if I can go back just a moment here. Yeah, right there. Man, that looks like an Impala SS. It really does. The wheels are kind of reminiscent, and that rear three quarters back there really looks like an Impala to me. But I, I, ooh, man, I forgot how much I like these cars. Honestly, this is, this is a really good looking car. And I'd like to say more holistic, I think, than like the Monte Carlo. Um, I never liked the Monte Carlos. I, I, almost any generation of them, they just never really did it for me. And certainly the later ones, uh, the front wheel drive ones, 
they just never quite did it for me. But this, I think it looks sleek and smooth and, you know, you maybe put some other wheels on it and a couple other things. That'd be pretty bad. Beep. You know, I think that looks right. great. The front end. Most noticeable are the monstrous air scoops and the new fascia with restyled hood and headlamps common to both LX and Super Coupe. Looks like flared nostrils, like it's a, a cheetah running. These cast aluminum directional wheels wear 16 inch 60 series tires, standard on the Super Coupe and optional on LX T-Birds. The rear fascia is also new and T-Bird continues to sport just about the largest tail lamps in Autodome. And so now that we're finally seeing a rear view, um, I, I, I like it. I just, this car does it for me. I like that character line that runs down the side uh, above the door handles. Modern cars, you see them tend to run through the door handles a little bit more. Um, but this big trunk, and I don't know why they're commenting on the size of the taillights. I like this. I think this car has some presence and some style. Uh, I, I, I like almost everything about it so far. There are, there are fewer obvious exterior alterations to the Mercury Cougar. The grille is new and very chrome bright, and the rear lamps rival the T-Birds in intensity. And so this car just looks, uh, granted they said it is more formal, it looks thin. That's the word, especially at the front, like the distance between the top of the wheel well and the hood, it looks thin. Thin uh, up at the front, it looks thin. The grill looks thin. I don't know if they were trying to go for dainty or not. But then, as you get down the side here, this rear window, they've squared it off a little bit. And the rear, it it's weird. It looks like the rear window is both vertical but rounded at the same time. I, I kind of like what Cadillac did more. I know these cars are in many cases much hated, but where you actually had the roof and then it just you're done. I kind of like that a little bit more, but I don't know. The Cougar's okay, but it doesn't quite do it for me. And I, I think they're taking a car that has a sporty essence and trying to make it look more formal, but I don't know. It's just not, not working for me. Unchanged from last year, the XR7 is the only model. The most welcome change to these rear-wheel drive twins comes in the engine compartment. Optional is this single overhead cam version of Ford's 4.6 liter modular aluminum head V8. Also used in its Crown Victoria and Mercury's Grand Marquis, it features sequential multi-point fuel injection and weighs 40 pounds less than last year's 5 liter all cast iron pushrod unit. The new V8 delivers 205 horsepower and 265 pound feet of torque. I, I kind of, I like these engines, uh, these engines. When, when they came out, I was opposed to them. Um, the, Mustang 5.0. I felt that 5.0 had a history behind it. So coming out with a smaller one never quite did it for me. But in hindsight, I have respect for these engines. I'm not an engine builder, guys. You know, I'm sure somebody has a complaint about them. But 205 horsepower, I mean, granted, this is almost 30 years ago. But, you know, telling me you've got your sporty coupe and you're taking this engine out of a Grand Marquis or something like that. Yeah, it doesn't, that doesn't tell me light and uh, uh, powerful acceleration. I respect the engine. I like the torque number. The power seems to be underwhelming, but translating it back 30 years, that's probably not bad. Curious to see how fast these things are because they, they weren't exactly light and nimble. The differences between V8 vintages are immediately noticeable when you hit the accelerator. With a quicker throttle response, the new V8 is much more willing to wind up and achieves a fine zero to 60 time of nine seconds flat. With both more initial power and better sustained acceleration, thanks to a wider torque band, we recorded a quarter mile time of 16.8 seconds, ending at 86 miles per hour. Because of reduced engine bulk, V8 T-Birds and Cougars feel less nose heavy, pushing less through corners, something they didn't do much anyway. Anti-lock brakes are available on all models. But when it comes to performance, the V8 still fits between two 3.8 liter V6s, the 140 horsepower unit standard in both cars, and the Super Coupe supercharged and intercooled wonder. Horsepower is up 20 to 230 with 315 pound-feet of torque. The Super Coupe will beat a V8 T-Bird LX to the end of the quarter mile by over a full second. 
But as satisfying as this supercharged powertrain is, it still lacks the bottom end punch and throaty sound of the new V8. Interesting. So if I'm being honest with myself, right? Again, hop into my time machine with me, go back to 1994 and I'm interested in one of these. You know what, I'd probably end up with the base V6. That's just kind of how I'm wired. And uh, while well, my first Buick had, I don't even remember, big V8 in it. Uh, my second Buick Regal, I think it was an 83, something like that, um, had the 3.8 liter in it. And I think it made about 140 horsepower then, um, something like that. And, you know, honestly, that's how I'd, I'd probably what I would have ended up getting, you know, a little bit extra gas mileage and I'm not really trying to race it. But uh, in hindsight, I'd go with the 4.6 liter all day long. This 3.8 liter supercharged, that's pretty impressive numbers. That's pretty cool. But to me, I just look at that and I just see more and more pieces that can break, right, over time. Um, yeah, I think the V8 would appeal to me the most right now. One more thing, if you want a five-speed manual, you'll have to stick with the Super Coupe. The new V8 comes four-speed automatic equipped only and can include a braking style traction control system. Inside all 94 Thunderbirds and Cougars is a fresh driver-oriented wraparound cockpit theme borrowed from Lincoln's Mark 8. Gag. Okay, so there's a couple of positives here. Okay, I see two, but um, oh my gosh, blue interiors, guys. Thank gosh they've gone away. This is hideous. I mean, maybe you wanna do something to spice up the interior, but why is it swaths of it everywhere? And you know, I've talked before in other videos about um, like the Mercury uh, Capri, the 90s were bad for Ford. I mean, they were doing some cool stuff, but they really lost their way in terms of quality, interior quality. Look at the opposite door over there, that passenger door. Look at how many cuts there are. All the different shapes and the, the roundness and the dash and all the the different edges. I, I mean, this is just, how could be, this be the cheapest way to assemble this thing? And how could it not squeak and start to fall apart? You know, I did that uh, review of, I don't remember the year, um, the Ford Ranger review. And, you know, the same thing here, it just... It doesn't even look like quality assembly. Look at the gap right there. Ford, I see what they were trying to do. I think they were trying to do ergonomics while adding some style, because when you look at that interior door handle, it looks big and chunky and round, but what you end up with is something not stylish. It has no essence of style to it. Ah, uh, this this does not this blue does not appeal to me. Maybe I like maybe I like the Mercury more from that perspective. Now, hopefully they show some more of it. I'll talk some more about it. But a couple of things that do jump out at me. Number one is on the right of the steering wheel there, where the uh, air conditioning and radio are and stuff. I like how it comes down like that. I like that shape. Um, I like that. You know, that was pretty pretty contemporary at the time when you think about what the Lexus LS was doing and some other cars of having that tilted towards you but all like one piece. I kind of like that. I like that the gear shift looks reasonable. It doesn't look like a baseball bat and it's not this tall, something like that. And then where the gear shift is, it rises, rises up to your little console right there. So you end up with this little swoop. I like some of the styling that they're trying to do here. If they show another view, I am willing to bet that where the instrument cluster is relative to that vent and the radio and everything else is, it looks to me like there's a big seam right there. And that's what drove me up the wall about the Ranger when it was new, this cheap construction, this cheap design that put a, a gap right there where I could stare at it all day long. Bad Ford, bad Ford. Stylish hideous colors, and I just, I, Ford could have done a lot better. Included are airbags for both driver and passenger, and this full set of analog gauges. 
Cougars get a voltmeter in place of the Super Coupe's turbo boost gauge. Staying put behind the Super Coupe's leather app steering wheel is easy with these articulated six-way power bucket seats. Driver's door-mounted power window and mirror controls fall easily to hand, while no hands are needed to operate the optional cellular telephone, though it also has controls on the dash. Ditto the efficient Freon-free -free climate control and stereo system. And this is another thing that drove me up the wall about Fords at this time is they just designed holes in the dashboard and then stuck something inside of it. And they never even tried to cover up these little square pieces right here, which might be how they're screwed in. Just almost everything about their interiors to me looks like an afterthought. Uh, somewhat stylish, but like they weren't sweating the details. You know what I mean? Plus, there's a full-size glove box, something not all dual airbag-equipped cars manage. Split 70-30, the rear bench seat folds part or all the way down, adding to the trunk's wide, flat 15.1 cubic feet of storage space. Inside the Cougar XR7, you'll find these standard cloth-covered bucket seats with leather on the bolsters. Oh my gosh, what, what is this monochromatic look from Ford? Um, here's the thing. I mean, the Cougar looks slightly different on the outside. It's the same dashboard. You're, you're, you're getting the Cougar, but you're not getting anything special in the process. Granted, it's not a Lincoln, but why? Why would you buy this except for maybe some options and interior options, things like that? when it's the exact same interior as the as the T-Bird, it, admittedly an uglier color. And this, and this lone piece of wood trim on each door. Continuing for the 94 model year is Ford's value pricing of both Thunderbirds and Cougars. This plan adds lots more features as standard equipment, then offers cars so equipped for a deep discount or no hassle price. A value price 94 Thunderbird LX would cost $16,830. On the other hand, the Cougar XR7's base price of $16,260 is even more reasonable. So it's easy to see why we've always been fans of these personal luxury performance coupes. And as long as Thunderbird and Cougar keep getting better, we'll stay that way. Oh, I've got so many thoughts. Um. The first is, this video is a great example to me of why Mercury no longer exists. Ford, and I think they're only really fixing it now with Lincoln, Ford never had a true strategy in my opinion for Ford, Mercury, and Lincoln. You bought a Mercury, but it wasn't really nicer than the Ford, it just looked more distinguished. So it was. They were two packages under two different names, the, the sporty and the luxury. They could have done that as two different packages under the Ford name without having a whole separate brand that they were trying to support. That's really disappointing in that the Mercury was the more affordable of them. That just makes no sense. It make that, that kind of poor planning of not differentiating the product and not making it worth slightly more so you could sell it for slightly more Mercury to me was never a move up to brand other than the fact that they did more chrome when you think about like the Ford Contour and the Mercury Mystique, for example. I'm glad it's gone. Um, be nice to still have it around if Lincoln was up here, Ford was here, and they tried to do something in that range of uh, where Buick is trying to exist. That would be kind of cool, but it was smart for them to get rid of it. To me, I like the T-Bird. And I have very mixed feelings on it. On the one hand, I, I like my Japanese cars, guys. I've been open and honest about that. I love Hondas. Uh, I respect Toyotas. And I had a Nissan for 10 years that was flawless. It was wonderful right up until about 100,000 miles. And I still like Nissan's seats and rides and quiet and dashboard designs. But back in the day, I liked American cars. I liked my Buicks and my Cadillacs and my Mustangs and everything else. And this car really appeals to me at a, a very 
almost a primal level. I can be very critical of it, not only the, especially the interior, but where it really sits. I mean, you're looking for a per personal luxury coupe. Well, re you're really just buying a two-door car. It's not like you're getting a BMW, you know, two-door five series or a Mercedes two-door. You're just getting a Ford with two doors. But it kind of speaks to me. I don't think that if this car existed in a modern form and I had a choice between that and a Cord that I would ever end up with something like this. This Cord just makes so much more sense fundamentally. And they have sporty versions, they have two-door versions, or they had, and they've got V6, used to have V6 versions. It, it, this car just doesn't make any sense. But that doesn't mean I wouldn't like to drive one. And that's where I'm kind of torn on it. I mean, it's just, it's got a lot of flaws. I, I think Ford almost mailed it in on the construction of the interior, if not the design. The design was halfway okay. The same thing with the rest of it. They've got a big platform, it's heavy. They put a big Ven engine in it. It still wasn't incredibly fast. It was competent, but it's not like you're gonna be racing something that's more focused. It's just another example of American companies saying, well, we've got this chassis. Well, let's, let's sell a two-door version of it. That's what this feels like. But again, that doesn't mean I don't want one. I enjoyed this. This was a good trip down memory lane because this is exactly what I wanted back when I was younger, my teens and my 20s. A big, comfortable car that had just a little bit of gumption and a little bit of style at the same time. I can't tell you how much I was looking at one of these back in the day, and I never got one. I don't remember what I ended up with afterwards. It might have been my Jeep, I don't know. But uh, this kind of appeals to me. This personal luxury um, kind of appeals to me. It, it's American, it's not fancy, it's not expensive, but a little bit more style. I'm an introvert. I don't need to carry people in the back seat. Two doors would be fine with me. I, I think I'd be happy with a car like this. That's what I'm trying to say. Let me know your thoughts below, guys. Appreciate you being here.